Alex. So I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Obviously, um, it's a kind of a crazy situation at the moment and time's probably, um, you could be spending time with your family and whatnot. And I really appreciate you just taking a small amount of time to talk to me. I'm an absolutely enormous fan of your work. Um, what I'd love to know is what first motivated you to try uh, photography. Yeah. So photography for me is, um, you know, kind of been my most recent, uh, creative pursuit. I grew up, um, very artistic and, uh, kind of always enjoyed pursuing artistic, um, uh, hab- uh, hobbies and the like. Um, you know, my first time really picking up a camera and trying to take it serious was on my honeymoon about 15 years ago. And, uh, I, I took a, a body of images that at the time I was very happy with. Um, I've certainly learned a lot over the last 15 years. Um, but then I got really busy. I got busy with work. I got busy with um, uh, having a family and kind of put the camera down for, for many years. Uh, and then it was actually Instagram that really kind of got me back interested in wanting to try photography. Um, we were on a, a family vacation in 2016, the summer of 2016. And that was the, the first time where I had taken pictures and then had someone else look at them besides my, my immediate family. And, um, and, and I had a lot to learn and it was really fun to just kind of get feedback and start to build community, um, on this app called Instagram. Um, I decided very early on that I'd have a public account. Um, and so I've never had a private Instagram account and, um, and that was, um, slightly terrifying, um, that anyone could see <laughs> my images from the beginning. Um, and at the same point, it, it felt like a really good way to get feedback and to, um, you know, try to take it seriously. And, uh, you know, I, I, I began, you know, that pursuit, um, very much focused on just things that were around me. Um, so just everyday items, um, in Minnesota, we have a lot of, uh, uh, lakes, we have more than 10,000 lakes. And so there's lots of opportunities for pictures in nature and, uh, pictures around the lake and things like that. And so that's where I really started and, uh, found out pretty quickly that I wasn't really, although the pictures might've been okay for the viewer, um, perhaps I, I wasn't really feeling connected to them. And so I went on a pursuit to find some other types of photography that would be more interesting to me. And so what then drew you towards street photography? Well, you know, I, I, so I started, um, I guess I'd go back and say, I, I don't even know if I'm a street photographer or not. Um, really what drew me to the style that I have now is really um, looking for light and shadow. And all of my work um, kind of focuses around that area. Um, the, the way I kind of started and, and really kind of started to look more closely at creating the type of images that I create now was actually um, through Instagram and through the communities that I was involved in. I was involved in some communities where they had these daily challenges and, you know, you would, they would give you a prompt for the daily challenge and then you'd go off and try to find, um, you know, try to make pictures that were um, addressing that daily prompt. Um, I was, I was participating those every day for probably the fall of 2016. And then they put out a call for people to be moderators or editors of that community. And I, uh, I I requested to be one and I was selected, which was a great opportunity. Um, and what it took for me was then you start looking at the, you go into a hashtag every day and you'd see thousands of images. And when you're looking at the, the Instagram, uh, a hashtag and you see all these images, it, it's really hard to stand out in that body of work. And so I started to notice the ways that um, work would stand out to me. And a lot of the work that I saw that stood out to me was um, very clear focus, single subject, um, minimal, uh, distraction free, such that if you're looking at you know, kind of this endless scrolling feed of, of photos that, that your picture can stand out in that group. And that was really where um, my style first started. And some of the people that participate in that community, um, I think also identified as street photographers and that kind of introduced me to that world of street photography. And really it was a matter of like looking at the right hashtags to understand that there's actually a community for this. Um, I'm not a photographer by training. Um, I'm a pediatric dentist. Um, so I've been in healthcare and, um, and so I, I really was looking at this from the perspective of somebody who was just interested in learning more about the craft. Um, and then, uh, you know, through Instagram and through following hashtags and learning about community, it led me to street photography. So, so something that you've sort of brought up there, which I think is really missed by a lot of people that take up pretty much any creative endeavor is that they don't acquire taste and they don't sort of learn what they actually like and what they don't like. And they don't spend a lot of time analyzing why they like it. Whereas obviously at the time you've spent curating, um, as, as, uh, someone that's interested in other people's photos and finding stuff that kind of awakens something in you obviously did a lot to progress 
um, your knowledge as well as your actual direction you wanted to go in. Would that be fair? I think that's totally fair. I'd, I'd say that as I look back on um, my creative pursuits over the years, even as a child, um, I have memories of, you know, drawing out fonts and words and block letters and adding shadows to them and outlining things in black and things that when you look at my images now, like that would look like it's consistent with my work. Um, you know, I've enjoyed, uh, in my work, in my professional life, making things like PowerPoint slides and, and putting a lot of order into those slides that if, you know, if a line is off by one, you know, one, I have to move it back to make sure that things are centered and in order. Mm -hmm. And so, so I, I've always kind of known that about myself. Um, and you know, and I, and I think that, that, that my photography is really, um, it's really a concentrated expression of, of kind of who I am, um, you know, both in the style that I have, um, and also in the subject matter that I have as well. And kind of how I look at, um, the, the work I do on the streets or looking for light and shadow as well. So I think, um, my interpretation, obviously from quite a healthy distance of your work is that what probably, if I was to guess, draws you towards, street let's call it street photography i know there's a lot of um a lot of uh, arguments over definitions and whatnot but you know you let's let's say you know city photography what would draw you towards cities is obviously you work with quite a lot of silhouette and you work quite a lot with very strong contrast and i think nature doesn't often lend itself to hard lines whereas city buildings and and walls and you know where lights being cut out by tall buildings is obviously very much about um, hard lines and silhouettes. So would it be fair to say that that's kind of what drew you in that direction? I think, I think everything kind of led me, um, you know, that the elements that I put together that kind of create my style are, um, one, I knew that I really wanted to reduce distractions and, and I recognized through the work of others when I was doing my job in curation that, um, those that use a lot of negative space, um, that negative space was serving as an element of order, um, to the composition. Um, you know, the geometry aspect, um, as you said, it's really hard in nature to find those hard lines. And for me, it was my move away from nature was less about that initially than it was about the fact that I never felt as though I had control over the composition, um, and the colors of the scene. Um, you know, in nature, you know, there's, there's gradients of color that, that we can't necessarily control in my work. I feel as though there's even kind of a graphic kind of graphic design type of quality to it. Um, and that comes by being able to control as many of the elements as possible, um, in camera, um, and, and making sure I can choose the right times of day, the right places to go. Um, but it's much harder in nature. I find to control the, the different colors of leaves and grass and things like that, that, um, I always found that I was, I was so focused on, what I did not like about the image than what I did like. And, and the scenes were beautiful. I just wasn't feeling as though they were a style that I resonated with. Quite often with your work, I've noticed that the negative space is the blacks as opposed to what a lot of people do with negative spaces. That's where they either have the most light or the most color. Um, is that a conscious choice that you want to have, you know, a significant portion of black take up negative spaces or is that just something that's kind of subconsciously coming out? You know, when I, when I saw the images and I kind of saw a style that I was interested in, black was definitely a big part of that. Um, and I kind of did at one point, probably a few years ago at this point, um, in a sense made kind of a rule or kind of put some restrictions around my work and said, you know, for a long period of time, it was going to be that it needed to include um, black negative space. It needed to include a human subject. And that was a much harder challenge for me to um, actually take pictures that included people because for most of the time I was using a camera before that I would wait for the people to leave the scene before I would take a photo. Um, and so that was a big kind of change for me, um, just based on my personality as well. And, and then it was, um, you know, just kind of really wanted to control the idea of, of removing distractions and black negative space, um, is, is very good at, at, at hiding the details that you don't really see as being part of the scene or wanting them to be part of the scene. In, in other words, there's plenty of things that exist in my, in the real world, in my scenes that are not part of the photo because they're in shadow. And that shadow is then, you know, obviously um, enhanced uh, further in post-processing to make sure that it's uh, completely black. So there's a lot of control there. In a sense of a timeline, how long was it between you kind of 
starting to see the seeds of where you wanted to end up. You started to get the inspiration for the sort of abstract work that you were doing. Um, how long was it from that point until you started to actually produce work that you felt like was kind of hitting the right markers? Well, you know, I look at my work now that I, uh, you know, so I started, I think the first photos I took, I think the first day, actually, I took a photo that I would consider to be somewhat in the genre of street photography was um, in April of 2017. And by that summer, um, you know, I was, I was a daily active participant in the street photography community on Instagram um, with many of the community, you know, uh, the community accounts and, and interacting with many people around the world. Um, you know, was my work of the same quality it is today. I, I don't know that any of us can say that about our previous work. We always feel like there's more work to learn. Um, but the style was, was, was present already that first, that first summer, just a couple months later. Um, because I, I kind of, I recognized how, how that style could come about, which was really kind of making sure that I understood what time of day, what type of, um, environment, you know, what kind of weather is the right time to shoot that type of image. Um, and I think many people over the years reach out to me and they ask how I, you know, how I create these types of images, perhaps in, in post-processing. And I say that these are, these are done 95% in camera. Um, and then just to try to explain like how that happens, you know, when, you know, what times of day, what type of sunlight. And, you know, I'm, I'm in a place where we have uh, amazingly harsh sun when we have sunny mm. days. So it's a, it's a, it's a great gift that I know a lot of other places in the world might not have. And, you know, and so it's, uh, um, so that's been definitely something that's on my side. We get a lot of, uh, a lot of days without clouds as well, which has been really great. So, um, those are things that I definitely take advantage of in my work. Being English, I wouldn't know what a day without a cloud is like, but it sounds wonderful. <laughs> um, does it become easier? Obviously one of the things that really fascinates me with your work is, is, how you see the compositions, especially with the more abstract stuff, how you actually see the composition develop. Um, does it get easier as time goes on for you to kind of see in abstract, if that makes sense? Yeah, you know, the the, the, the kind of stepwise approach I took to kind of learning this, I think at this point, I see light pretty much subconsciously. So if I'm in a space, if I'm in a room or I'm walking down a, a corridor in a building and there's light coming through a window kind of off you know, to my right or to my left, I subconsciously see the light at this point to, and stop and say, okay, I should look at this. And so, um, I, I think that there was a lot of, I mean, I've, I've, I've definitely spent a lot of time, um, both, you know, with a camera and kind of taking photos, but then also looking at other people's photos through Instagram and other places that, um, I definitely feel like I've put a lot of time and effort into that. But, but really where it started with me was I, I didn't start with a camera. I started, I started with my smartphone. And, you know, for me, and I think I, I learned this watching some YouTube videos, I think maybe, uh, I'm not sure if this was something that uh, Rinzi Ruiz had talked about, and he's a, a street photographer who does a lot of uh, high contrast black and white. And I think he talked about, you know, just dialing in your smartphone, um, you know, on the black and white setting or even the noir setting. Um, and so when you do that, you really are only seeing light. And then I, you know, by adjusting the exposure compensation, you're really just looking for highlights in a scene. And, you know, unlike, or very much like a street photographer who takes photos at night and they're just using those, those artificial light sources as the way to kind of guide them through the city. Um, I do the same with light. Um, I really don't look for, I don't look for these types of scenes to develop. I just follow the light around the city. Um, and at this point I know my city well enough that I know what times of day, what times of, of the year I'm going to find certain patches of light that makes my, my job of looking for light a lot easier, um, versus the beginning where I would kind of wander aimlessly looking for these patches of light that, that would then become part of the composition. So it does become easier in the sense, but I think it's, it's some of it's the, you start to see light everywhere and you start to kind of. Uh, digest what you see um, more than just kind of going, oh, there's light. I, I now look and I see beyond just the fact that there's light to kind of what the, the light is highlighting, you know, kind of what's in the scene around it, you know, what would happen. And, and my eyes now, I think at this point, even see, see the darkness around the light, which makes things a lot easier as well. Um, but as I said, the other part is really just kind of knowing your environment. Um, I've been in other cities over the last couple of years and those first couple of days, it, it is kind of a change to kind of, once you, you know, if you don't know the city to, to be able to do the exact same type of process that I do, but in my city, I know it very well at this point and um, feel very comfortable that the, the images do um, present themselves much easier. The challenge has been, how do I continue to make new 
uh, you know, a, a new composition out of the same elements. Um, and some of that's the, the light is different at certain times of the day, certain times of the year. Um, some of that's just, um, I've grown and I've, I've tried new perspectives on things, different focal lengths, that kind of stuff as well. It's funny. You just rifled through about three of my bullet points here. Um, one thing I did want to know is about you revisiting locations and something I think photography has a real problem with at the moment is, uh, people learn that something is popular because we have this metric of working out if something's popular by just looking at how many people double click on it. And once they learn that they've got a sort of set subject or a set idea of what's going to get the most likes, they just continue to hit the same nail over and over again. Um, I was actually going to ask you about if you're kind of revisiting the same places, is it a real discipline to kind of stop yourself from just going for what you know will work? Well, I think, you know, I, I think I've also gone through stages there of um, there's definitely types of images in, in you know, the, the places where I will hashtag my photos to an Instagram where I know that they will do um, generally pretty well just because the algorithm will help them do well and they'll, they'll show the image to more people. Um, for me, it's really about looking at those and saying, okay, what, what did I do last time? How can I make it one more layer of complexity this time? Um, a perfect example would be, you know, if I see a patch of light on a building two years ago, I would have stood directly across the street from that patch of light and caught a very kind of flat image where there wouldn't have been a lot of three-dimensionality to it because I didn't, I, I wasn't seeing that way yet. Um, now I will stand at more of an angle. I'll find a different vantage point of that same potential, that same patch of light, which will create a totally different scene. Um, obviously the subjects within the scene are important as well. Although I don't think that my images necessarily are, are focused on, um, that, that subject being the most important part of the scene. I think they're just one compositional element. Um, you know, for me, the, the perspective of, of getting low or, you know, if I can go up to a second floor of a building versus being on the ground level, that changes the perspective dramatically. And, and my city is very interesting in the sense that um, if you walk around the city, especially in the winter, and let's say there was no people like it, like what we're seeing right now, if there's no people in my city, it's pretty much the, it's a straight canvas of concrete. Uh, we have very little, um, we have very little trees or shrubbery or anything that, that would draw your eye. Um, we do not have a lot of ground level shops, um, or stores. There's not a lot of artificial lights because in Minnesota, it's very, very cold. And so we have these skyways that are one floor above or kind of the second floor of buildings and they connect across the street those do a couple of things. One is they cast wonderful shadows when it's, when there's hard light and two, it, it kind of moves everything off of the city streets. So the clutter that you might see in another city, we don't have in Minneapolis and a lot of the areas that I shoot. And so for me, it's like looking at these new vantage points um, and finding new ways to kind of, you know, I, I have probably at this point, there's probably 40 images that, 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 have been, you know, on, on the internet in various ways, they're all shot within a one block radius of, of themselves. Um, and there are 40 different perspectives of the same city block, um, just based on time of year where the sun is, you know, kind of hitting the buildings and the skyways, what shadows are created, uh, and so on. And so, yeah, it's really, uh, it, the funny thing is I actually, I'm in the twin cities in Minneapolis and St. Paul, and I haven't taken any photos in St. Paul yet. So I actually have a whole nother city to explore <laughs> and I just haven't <laughs> gone there yet. So I, I've been saving that up for you. Maybe this summer will be, you know, if we're, if we're allowed to go out on the streets again to, to take photos, I will maybe make my way over there. But, um, but I work uh, closer to Minneapolis and I live um, west of Minneapolis and St. Paul is east of Minneapolis. So it makes for a longer drive home and things like that. So um, a lot of my photography is also about convenience. Um, I, I don't get out and shoot every day. And so uh, many people ask me like, like, how do you always take pictures, you know, in this, in this hard slate? I'm like, well, I only go out on those days because I'm, I'm, I'm busy with, with my work and with my family. And so, um, you know, I don't get out every day. Maybe I'm lucky if I get out once a week. Um, and, you know, I try to be pretty productive on the streets on that, and that two hour, uh, photo walk that I'll do, you know, once a week or so. Um, but you know, as an example, I don't think I've been out, I think I've been out once in 2020, maybe twice. And wow. so, some of this is about the archive. Some of it is about, uh, you know, I've been trying to create a lot of my imagery um, close to home at this point. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's the same thing of just looking for light and trying to make something interesting out of it. So you said you visited a few other cities and, and had trouble with the early days photographing, kind of finding your um, finding your your wheelhouse there, I guess. Um, 
which of those cities has worked the best for you? Well, I've been to I've been to Chicago a few times, and Chicago is a, is an amazing city for for my my type of street photography, my type of uh, photography in general. Um, because once again, there's just this wonderfully intense sunlight. There's a lot of great architecture in that city. Um, you know, you, you have lots of potential of going above the city, um, going a couple floors up in some places as well. And so there's, there's uh, wonderful opportunities there. I've been to New York um, one time since I've been um, taking a lot of, taking a lot of photos. Um, I was there in a week when the weather was not uh, very sunny. And so that was a little bit more challenging. Um, but I, uh, I think that those are the two that have been the most, um, most interesting to me. I've been some other places just for work that, um, you know, you can find some places here and there within the city, but uh, obviously those two cities, Chicago, and New York are, are, are wonderful places for uh, all types of street photography for sure. So on your website, your work's divided up into sort of four main categories. Um, do you, when you say you, you, you go out, you know, maybe you said lucky to go out once a week, do you go out with the intention of focusing on one of those categories or do you go out and just adapt to what you're given by the environment? I definitely just adapt to what I'm given. Um, I, I really go out with no, um, no plans in mind. Um, it's, for me, these two hour photo walks are as much about kind of, um, a stress reliever from work and life and things like that. Um, and you know, a lot of, a lot of my work is you can, there's multiple layers of, of the types of images I take and they can all be done at the same type of scene. Um, especially with the architectural elements, many times I'll find a scene. I'm, I'm kind of more of like the, the fisher fisherman versus the hunter with regards to street photography. So I'll find a scene that I like with, with really great light. Um, and then I'll spend time there and wait for, you know, a human subject to, um, kind of walk through the scene or, or in some way interact with the scene. Um, and so I have these times, I have these moments when it's just me with an empty scene with just light shadow line and shape, and I can work with those. And a lot of my, my abstract images come from those times. Um, it could also be the time I'm standing on the, the corner waiting for a stoplight to change. And, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing about my city in Minneapolis is that, um, you know, we have, we have many tall buildings, lots of glass reflections. Um, and the light, especially around this time of the year, it tends to really illuminate the tops of the buildings and it leaves most of the city in shadows. And so a lot of the images that, that I've been posting in the last six to nine months on Instagram um, have been those images where, you know, the, the, the buildings are lit up and then there's a lot of negative space around them. And that's just the, that's just from standing, you know, in a, finding a nice place in shadow in the city um, using the architecture of these shadowed buildings to then, kind of highlight the buildings that are illuminated by the sun. And so, um, so a lot of this is just layers. It, it, it enables me to just kind of be productive. Um, I, I try to come home. Um, I try to, when I go out, I, I tend to come home with a fair number of images that I'm happy with. Um, I know that some will say like, you know, if you come home with too many images, you're not trying hard enough. And for me, I just kind of look at the different types of photography that I do. Um, and then I, th I do see at my time of the day that I shoot when the sun is so intense, um, sometimes the color in the images is completely lost because the sun is that, that intense. And so some of those images become black and white as well. And so, um, so between mixing up color and black and white, also looking at scenes that include people versus those that do not, um, that kind of gives me a lot of variability in the work. And then, um, a lot of my other abstract images truthfully happen just in my daily life. Um, I tend to walk, I walk, you know, to and from my car into my, my place of work with my cell phone out um, and the camera open because you never know what you're going to find along the way. And so a lot of these are just things that I've seen where you know, there's beautiful light walking in on a, on, a, on a path into work and then I'll take a photo there or see a building that's lit up or whatever it might be. So um, I do carry my camera now with me all the time too. So I've, I've definitely become much more uh, focused on making sure that I never miss an image. Um, uh, I've, I've felt that regret enough times now where I, I've seen something and I go, oh, I wish I would have had my camera today. So now I always carry my camera. Um, I have two Fuji cameras, I, the, the X100F that I've had for the, since uh, December of 2017. That goes with me every day to work. Um, and then I don't tend to bring my X-T3 and um, only on the days when I'm going to go do a photo walk. One of the things I find with abstract work is that sometimes people 
viewing it can have a trouble finding an emotional connection to it. Um, do you find when you go out and you're perhaps in a bad mood, you've had like a bad week at work or, or whatever's caused you to be in a bad mood, that would affect the way that you shoot abstract work compared to when you're in a good mood? Is there an emotional influence on what you're producing? That's a great question. Um, I think I'm, I, I, I tend to have a very kind of mild mannered personality. I don't feel like I, I become, um, kind of, I don't think my mood changes very much. I think it's pretty steady. Um, you know, for me, um, sometimes I, I, I take some images and I think subconsciously there might be more to the story, um, that I didn't recognize when I was taking the image. And then when I'm looking at it kind of on the computer later, I'm like, wow, this is like more moody than I thought it was. I, I wasn't expecting that. And sometimes those become the posts that, you know, I think some people say that that looks like your work, but it's different. And, um, but usually there's not, there's not an emotional kind of background to those. Um, for me, I, I feel I, I'm always so happy just to be able to take pictures and, and finding the light. Um, I've literally been walking around my house the last you know couple of weeks when the sun is out and I mean, I'm just taking pictures of anything I can just to, to stay active with, um, using my camera. So, um, so I don't know that my mood really changes that dramatically. Um, although, um, I don't know that uh, a lot of times the work I post and some of the stuff I post is post much later than the day that I took the image. And so maybe I was feeling something that day that if I looked back closely, I'd say, wow, that was a tough week at work or maybe something was going on and maybe that reflects it. But um, I think my work just because there's so much black in, in the images as a whole, some people look at my work as being very dark. Um, and I think others see it as being very kind of uplifting and light. So it's really just kind of how the viewer perceives the work as well. I think the thing that strikes me the most about your work and something that I definitely have to admit to kind of trying to steal a little bit and failing miserably is the, uh, the way that you treat blues in your image. Um, how did, how did you go about coming up with your sort of, um, your color choices when it came to your post-processing? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, um, when I first was taking pictures, going back to when I was taking nature pictures, the sky, I really did not like the way that I was able to photograph the sky, especially the sky with clouds and other gradients of color in the sky. Um, to the point that when I started with street photography, I completely, that was part of like the, the, the unwritten rules I had for myself, which were like, do not include the sky because it's going to change the kind of the, the, the nature of the image it's, and I'm not going to be happy with it. So my first year or first year and a half of taking street photos, everything was, was very much, there was no sky involvement at all. Um, and then I don't know how it even, I'm not sure how it started. I feel like it maybe was, um, it was in 2019 where this kind of started. And I think it was actually taking pictures in the garage at where I work, um, where I parked my car and, um, you know, I just, it was the first time I had seen a scene where there was, there was just a clear blue sky. And that was the first time I was like, well, I got to really try this. And, you know, how do I get to the extra color blue? I mean, it really was one where I just started playing around a bit in Lightroom. Um, you know, I have, I've never set a preset for anything. So the colors that I have and that, that you see, you know, when I post an image, each one of those pictures has been edited you know, separately to get that color of blue, um, which I know I should probably just set a preset at this point, but I, I haven't done that. So, um, <laughs> so it's really, it's, it's really just a matter of like, I think I have, you know, kind of a memory of the color and you know, I, I would bet if we put them up next to each other that they're close, but they're not exactly the same. Now, sometimes if I've taken, you know, if I've, I've worked one scene and I have six or seven images there, and I'm in Lightroom, I will copy, you know, the, the, the settings I use from one to the others, but across scenes, I don't have any type of preset that I use. So, um, so yeah, it's just a matter of playing with the colors a bit. Um, you know, the, and even the filters in, um, in the Instagram app can also be helpful. Um, they, they do change the color slightly as well. And so I've, I've used them a, a bit as well. So, um, so yeah, it's just, it's just kind of trial and error. Um, and I've just been, for me, the, 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 the blue has been a, it's been an interesting evolution. Um, and for me, it was just, it was recognizing that I actually do like photographing the sky as long as I don't have a lot of clouds in the sky. And so, um, seeking out those days when, when this, the sun is out and there's no clouds has been uh, a further restriction to my work that has, has led to some of the, you know, the, the types of images I've had in the last six months. The uh, really abstract parts of your work, I think, 
could potentially be misconstrued as almost being graphic design because they're so clean and so sharp and so the colors are so well defined. Do you ever have an issue where people misinterpret your photography as being graphic design or look at it as, you know, being something that's been kind of overprocessed? Um, I think, you know, I have, I have, I have people that follow me on Instagram. I, I look at people's bios and their profiles. And there's many graphic designers that follow my work. Um, and I don't know if that's because they, they resonate with that type of graphic style. Um, you know, I think some people, I mean, I don't tend to, I, I kind of just stay in my lane with regards to the work that I produce. And the, you know, there's probably some people that believe it's way over processed. Um, I, what I will say is that the abstract work especially is, is actually um, probably less processed than any other work I do. Um, these, mm. these architecture scenes that you see that kind of have this three dimensionality to it, those are pretty close to right out of camera. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's an under a minute in Lightroom just to kind of maybe tweak the blacks a little bit. Um, but there's, there's, it's amazing how clean those are coming out of camera. Um, which as I said, it's not, and I don't think that's because of the, my, 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 my skill with the, with the camera, it's about, I've, I've really focused on making sure I had the ideal setting to use the camera. And so it's mm -hmm. making sure I'm out at the right time of the day. I'm in the right scene at the right time, you know, where the light is at the right point. You know, there's many scenes that I see that I walk straight by because I'm like, well, there's, there's something about this that's just not working. Um, and, you know, as I said, in the, the sky is without clouds. There's all these types of things. And so it's a, for me, you know, a, a point for those listening to this would be is start to identify what's important to you in your images and then to try to be as, as um, focused on looking for those elements and making decisions that help you to have those types of things happen. Like you, these are not things that... I, you know, if you find it one time, but if you keep reproducing it, you have to make those decisions to have that type of, um, we'll call it luck every time. Um, and so I've been looking for those very, um, very specifically for six months. Um, so I think it's kind of turned in somewhat of a project at this point. Um, although I didn't really set out with that to be the goal. I think for any photographer that's working with outside influence, um, and obviously you're at the mercy of not only the weather, but people interacting with your scene and, uh, sort of time of day and where you can actually be available to be and whatnot. It's a lot of it is down to luck and having worked for about the last seven years myself as a wedding photographer, um, you have have to make your own luck. I think a lot of people misconstrue luck as being something that some, it either happens to you or it doesn't. Whereas I think a lot of it is just down to you putting yourself in the best position to be lucky. Would that, would that be something you agree with? Absolutely. I, I think both in my, my architecture kind of imagery, as well as my street imagery, um, you know, I mentioned the light, I mentioned kind of the right time of day, but that also gets into like knowing the the amount of people on the streets in the city and say, okay, like this is a time when I, I will have a better chance of having a single subject versus having groups of people. As an example, I very seldom go to the city on a Saturday because on a Saturday I've been there enough times to know that like there's no single subjects walking around on a Saturday. It's always couples. And, mm -hmm. and not that there's anything wrong with photographing couples in my scenes, but it's not always clean because they're walking next to each other and unless you can separate them, those are very hard images to, 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 to get just right. And so, um, so for me, it's, it's kind of right at the end of a work day when everyone is leaving the city, um, is a great time because it's, it's busy enough that I can, I have multiple subjects and I'm not waiting at a scene with great light and just watching the light fade because no people came by. Um, you know, so I have to kind of, there's always that decision making of how long do I stay at a scene and then move on or, you know, like, and so it's really understanding like, Am I on a scene that's heavily traveled or not heavily traveled? So, yeah, as you said, it's it's it, there's there's definitely the luck comes from knowing that you're taking away as many of the elements that make uh, that make it challenging. Um, so I've definitely zeroed in on times of day, what's the right days of the week, what's the right environment, um, you know, and um, and for me, I have very few choices when it comes to the time of the year because. Uh, I have about at least a quarter of the year where it's it's too cold to even be outside in our city to be able to take photos, and so um, at least three four months of the year it's 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 um, much too cold to be outside for more than fifteen minutes at a time. So to circle back on um, your sort of metering and the way that you're sort of setting up the exposures for your shots, something I would say looking at your work is that it's very much about making sure your highlights are where the information is and letting your shadows really broaden um, and almost 
crush them completely so that that's how you establish those hard lines. Um, I've taught photography at various workshops for a few years now. And something that I find um, to be sometimes a little bit funny is people's worship of histograms and how the histogram basically can tell you whether or not an image is correct. Um, I'm sure your images must be a, a histogram lover's worst nightmare. Uh, absolutely. And I can tell you, um, I think I've looked at the histogram maybe once or twice in three years. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't, you know, and I think that was one of my challenges when I first started photography was I, you know, read the books and you'd read all these things that you're supposed to do. And I'd be using a, a camera where you couldn't see the changes you were making live like you can with a mirrorless camera. And so, um, you know, the switch that I made to Fuji, um, and it could be other cameras. It doesn't have to be that it's a Fuji camera, but you know, that idea of being able to see what the settings do visually versus just kind of understanding them technically, um, was really helpful to me. Um, and yes, I, I'm sure everything on my image is pushed, you know, way to the left and, you know, very dark and, um, yeah, but for me, it's just all the visuals. And for a long time, I shot just aperture priority, uh, where I would obviously set my, my, um, my, my, I'd be at F8 to F10, somewhere around there, um, because the scenes are very bright. I'd have a very fast shutter speed so I could freeze motion and then just kind of adjust the, you know, adjust the exposure for the highlights. Um, now I'm at the point, uh, with the X-T3 where I, I just, uh, I shoot in manual and it's just a matter of just having a balance of the, the, the various settings to get the same effect. Um, and mm -hmm. so I, I tend not to spend a lot of time thinking about it. I just, you know, I know where the dials are. I know how to, you know, as I'm looking through the scenes, I'm not stopping. I'm not, um, you know, focused on, okay, I need to go into the, the LCD screen and type in some very, you know, different uh, variables. I'm just, you know, turning dials and, and ready to go. And, um, yeah, but I, I'm sure that um, many people would look at my my uh, histograms and not be very happy with what they see, um, you know. But for me, I, I also know what I can what I can recover in post processing, um, and I think the biggest change that came for me and, and when I look at my own work um, from kind of 2018 to 2019 was um, having more respect for. Um, recovering a bit of the highlights um, that I think I would underexpose too far at times and then realizing that I needed to bring them back um, a bit more. And so when I look at my older work, um, the, 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 the dark blacks have been there. Um, I just didn't have a really good white point or a highlight point um, that I think I've been able to find more of um, in this last year. So definitely still learning. I said, I'm not a, uh, I, I've, I have no formal training in photography. I'm kind of learning as I go. And, uh, um, you know, so there's probably plenty of things I still have left to learn. I, um, I think I've, I've done a pretty good job of staying in my narrow lane at this point, but, um, <laughs> I, I would probably be, a, I'd be a terrible mess if you gave me any other conditions. So, um, I, I'd like to think that, uh, um, you know, I, I've, I'm a specialist, not a generalist at this point. Well, I think a histogram is something that a lot of people use to tell you that a bad photo is good. Um, when they've taken an image that's just not emotionally interesting or visually in any way complex, the histogram kind of lets them off the hook. A lot of people just use a, a camera to find middle gray and that'll do. And they have a that'll do mentality because they're ticking technical boxes. But um, finding a style is something that's so um, underrated and especially finding a consistent style. Um, what What is it about your particular work that fulfills you to the point where you can be so, I don't like your word, but I'll use your word narrow, um, how you can be so narrow with your style. What, what is it that fulfills you with your work that allows you to do that? You know, I think the, the, the light and shadow aspect of my work is really what draws me to the work. I mean, and if we kind of compare it or contrast that with graphic design is, you know, these images for the viewer, they look, they look to be, there's a sense of order there. There's a sense of, um, you know, as you say, kind of this graphic quality. But for me, these are all real life scenes that I've, I've been a part of. I've been in that, I've been in that room. I've been in that space. I've seen that person walk by. And so for me, it, it's, it, I'm just still, I'm so drawn to the type of photography that I do because I know what the scene looked like. I felt all the, the sensory aspect of that scene. And then to see the end product and go, wow, that really came together nicely. Um, continues to be really interesting to me. Um, and whether that's something that, you know, I take a photo in my, in my, my kitchen at home, or if it's on the streets of, of Minneapolis, um, it's it just, it's, uh, 
it just makes a lot of sense to me. And as I said, I, I've, I know what it feels like when the images don't connect to me personally. Cause as I said, I was, when I was doing my nature photography, that's how I felt was even if the image was something that others would say looked nice, I, I just didn't feel connected to it. So I think it connects, my images connect to me at, at, a, at a much personal level. The street photography as an example, um, I am a quiet person. I'm an introvert. I'm the, somebody that if I was on the city streets, I'd be walking alone. I wouldn't be with a group of people. So I see myself in a lot of my images as well. Um, and as I said, it comes back to the viewer recognizing whether um, the elements of my images, like what, what they read that to be. For me, it's about order. It's about um, kind of design. It's about making um, making choices. Um, it's about um, just feeling as though um, I have control. And I think those are all things that are important. And so my images continue to have that approach because that's just how I live my life at this point. So you're a tremendously busy person with your work and with your family. How are they about you, your family, especially? How are they about you spending your time uh, or spending some of your time with photography. Yeah, I think they're. I think they're definitely have my, my my wife and kids. Are, I think are happy that I have um, a creative outlet from from my my professional work and the like. Um, I, I do. I, I have a personality type where um, I'm kind of a you know uh, like let's not get involved in something that we can't do a hundred percent or I'm somebody that has to do it a hundred percent. And so I can become very much uh, focused on on photography to the point where I have to be kind of pulled away from it and, uh, and rightfully so, um, for, for family time and family activities. And so, um, I think they understand me, they know me very well. Um, I think that, um, I, I definitely have to be very conscious about how much time I spend because, um, cause I do love photography so much, but I love my family much more. A bit of a two part question. Um, but how are things obviously with the current pandemic? How are they where you are and how are you staying motivated and how are you using the time? Well, as I mentioned, I, I so uh, for me with everything that's happening, I, I'm a healthcare worker uh, for my professional work. And so there's certainly an, an aspect of that, of, um, of preparedness of being ready. Should I be called on to work? Um, as a dentist, uh, we're kind of in a limited capacity with work right now due to the, some of the procedures that we do would be very high risk for our healthcare workers to be able to do safely. Um, um, but I teach. So I work with uh, students who are learning the craft of, of dentistry that, um, that I do. And so, um, so I work from home a lot, um, at this point, um, I'm, I'm a, as an introvert, as a more of a kind of a home body type of person. Um, I haven't found this part of being home as challenging as maybe some other people. Um, but I do find that, um, you know, I miss being out. I miss, I miss being outside and, and having the opportunity to, to really be active as well. So, um, so I'm, I'm grateful. I'm healthy and my family's healthy and, and everyone that I know at this point that I work with and, and know closely are healthy. And that's certainly the most important thing. Um, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of preparedness at work to make sure that we can keep people healthy when we're called upon to, to work with patients. And, um, at home we're we're trying to stay, uh, stay active and creative. Um, you know, my kids are preparing for school as well. And so, uh, lots of challenges is to get used to different routines. Um, but, uh, but it's been, a, it's been an interesting few weeks as, as it has been for everybody, I'm sure. Absolutely. I think um, one of the main sort of pushes for me at uh, the last, so the UK has been sort of on lockdown for about two weeks now. And it was one of the big pushes for me to kind of, I would probably do about two podcasts a month normally. And I've done, I think nine in the last seven days, purely to just generate some, um, some, I don't like the word content, but to generate some content for people that are, you know, bored or looking for something to, especially to take their mind off of the way that the media is constantly trying to scare everybody into a frenzy. It's nice to have a distraction. So that's why I do the podcast. Um, what are you, what are you doing to keep yourself distracted in terms of, you know, motivating yourself uh, with your work? Yeah. So with, uh, so with my photography related, uh, I'll call it work and more hobby, but, you know, just trying to, you know, I'm looking back through, you know, my archive as I always tend to do, um, but really trying to create something every day. Um, and we've, we've been lucky the last week or so we've had some sunny days. And so, um, you know, just kind of exploring how I can create imagery at home. Um, also before all this started, I was working on pulling together my images into, um, kind of a zine or books and things like that. And so, um, just looking to expand on that as well. Um, you know, I, I enjoy the process of making those types of, um, 
kind of end products of my work. Um, whether I sell them or not is, is kind of a secondary type of thing. And so just for me, the idea of having those books around the house and saying, well, look what I created. Um, because my photography started really through Instagram and really has lived primarily on Instagram, this idea of learning about printing, learning about how to um, view my work off, you know, in a, in a physical form and not being on a computer or a device screen has been really interesting. And so that's just kind of learning how to better do that. And, um, and I like to write and some other things. So I think as this continues to go on, I'll probably start to, to do a little bit more writing about my photography as well. You're an absolutely wonderful person, a fantastic photographer, incredibly humble, and you have a beautiful accent. Um, one thing I want to make sure we do is we get as many people as possible to see your work. So could you please give us your various links of where people can find your amazing work? Yeah. So on social media, I'm at um, Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-M. K-A-R-P and on all the social media channels that I'm aware of at least. And my website is also www.jeffreymcarp.com. It's been absolutely incredible to talk to you. I'm, I'm so honored to have, have had your time for this long. Thank you so much for answering some of my stupid questions. Um, and I really hope you are staying safe and, and motivated through all of this horrible sort of um, nonsense that we're going through. It's been a great pleasure, Chris. I had a great time. I really appreciate you. Um, I appreciate the the work you're doing. I've been listening to your podcast and I, I really enjoy the interview. So I'm just, I'm humbled and honored to be uh, one of your guests and uh, I wish you uh, the best as well. Stay healthy and well and uh, look forward to connecting with you on, on Instagram and other places as well. 